Good morning. So my job today is to introduce the influenza session and today's speakers for the influenza session. Uh, here are the members of the influenza working group. The ACIP members besides myself are Ed Belanja and Peter Salaji, and we have uh, our ex officio members and consultants and liaison representatives uh, make up the work group. So it's a quite large work group, as you can see. Uh, just as a reminder, I'm going to recap our last ACIP meeting and what we talked about in the influenza session. We had an update on flu mist or live attenuated influenza vaccine at the last meeting. We will not have an update today. Uh, we'll, uh, we had a presentation on a fluria, uh, inactivated vaccine, the trivalent, and an investigation into the Southern Hemisphere 2010 adverse events, which included febrile reactions and febrile seizures. Uh, then we had a discussion of the study of flu, flu zone high dose vaccine, uh, high dose uh, uh, trivalent vaccine among long term care uh, residents. Uh, since the last meeting uh, in February, uh, we, the work group has continued to have bi weekly calls. Uh, during those calls, we've been working on this year's ACIP influenza statement. Unlike the last session, we don't update every 10 years. We get to update annually. So. Um, and we've also had updates on influenza vaccine effectiveness and safety. So today's agenda, we have a, a fairly full agenda, so I'm going to just briefly read through. Uh, we'll have an influenza surveillance update uh, done by uh, Miss Alicia Budd from the Influenza Division. Uh, then Jill Ferdinands will come up and give us an update on influenza vaccine effectiveness. Uh, that will be followed by an update on 2016-17 influenza vaccine safety monitoring by Tom Shimabakuro of the Influenza uh, Safe Immunizations, excuse me, Safety Office. And then following that, we'll have a, a presentation from Protein Sciences uh, regarding some data about flu block during pregnancy. Uh, and then that will lead us into the final discussion uh, by our leader, uh, Dr. Lisa Groskopf, for the Influenza Working Group, uh, talking about the proposed recommendations for this year's season. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Ms. Alicia Budd. Good morning. So this morning, I'm going to give you an update on influenza activity that occurred in the US during the 2016-2017 season. And just a reminder that these data are preliminary and could change slightly as we continue to get reports in. So this graph shows data reported to CDC by the clinical laboratories um, across the US as of June 16th, and includes data through the week ending um, June 10th. So for the season as a whole, clinical laboratories reported testing almost 900,000 specimens, and more than 120,000 were positive for influenza. 70% of the specimens were influenza A viruses, shown here in yellow, and 30% were influenza B viruses, shown in green. Nationally, the percent of specimens testing positive for in influenza peaked at approximately 24% during the three weeks from mid to late February. But we did see regional differences in timing of influenza activity across the country, with the Northwest and the West, in particular HHS regions 8 and 10, peaking in late December, followed by the Southwest, region 9, peaking in mid-January, and then the rest of the country peaking in February. And as we often see in influenza seasons, um, we saw an increase in influenza B activity later in the season. And in fact, each week since late March, influenza B viruses were reported more frequently than influenza A viruses. And then to look at the virologic data in a bit more detail, we have data reported from US public health laboratories on the number of influenza positives by influenza A subtype and influenza B lineage. So far this season, public health laboratories have reported testing more than 85,000 specimens, of which more than 41,000 were positive for influenza. 
Influenza A H3N2, which is shown here in red, was the predominant virus overall this season, accounting for 75% of all of the viruses reported by the public health labs and 97% of the influenza A viruses reported by these laboratories. You can also see here in these data the increase in flu B activity later in the season shown in green. And overall, influenza B viruses comprise 22% of the viruses reported by public health labs. And of those viruses for which we have lineage information available, 71% were Yamagata lineage and 29% were Victoria lineage viruses. CDC performs additional genetic and antigenic characterization of a subset of the viruses that are submitted by the public health laboratories. And this slide shows the result of genetic characterization of nearly 2,500 viruses collected in the US since October 1 of 2016. The single pie chart on the left represents the same data that you saw previously in the bar graph and just depicts the relative proportion of the various um, types and subtypes and lineages reported by the public health laboratories. On the right side of the slide are the pie charts showing the genetic uh, distribution or the distribution of the genetic groups rather within each influenza A subtype and influenza B lineage. And there was a, only a small amount of variability in terms of the genetic groups that were circulating this season in the US, with 93% of the H3 viruses tested belonging to the 3C2A genetic group, 99% of the H1 PDM09 viruses belong to the 6B1 genetic group, and all of the B Victoria and B Yamagata lineage viruses belong to the V1A or Y3 genetic groups, respectively. CDC also performed antigenic characterization on more than 1,800 influenza viruses collected in the US since October 1. 99% of the H1 PDM09 viruses tested were antigenically similar to the reference virus representing the H1 component of the 2016 2017 vaccine. 95% of the H3N2 viruses were antigenically similar to the reference virus for that component of, that, of the vaccine and 87% of the B. Victoria lineage viruses were antigenically similar to the reference virus representing the B. Victoria lineage component that was included in both the trivalent and quadrivalent vaccines this year. Some of the B. Victoria viruses that had reduced titers against the B. Brisbane 60 2008-like virus have similar genetic changes that appear to be altering the antigenic properties of the viruses, and these viruses, in general, comprised a very small proportion of the circulating viruses during this season, but we're continuing to monitor to see if there's any change in the prevalence of these viruses. And all the B. Yamagata lineage viruses um, tested were similar to the reference virus included in the vaccine this year. So this graph shows the percentage of outpatient visits for influenza-like illness reported by healthcare providers participating in the ILINET surveillance system. Data from this season are shown in red, and nationally, the weekly percent ILI was at or above the national baseline of 2.2% from the middle of December until early April, and peaked at 5.1% during the week ending February 11th. For all of us, this felt like a particularly long influenza season, um, and that was actually borne out by the fact that this season we were at or above baseline for 17 consecutive weeks, where the average um, over the last 15 seasons is to be above baseline for 13 weeks. So through the Influenza Hospitalization Surveillance Network, we have population-based surveillance for lab-confirmed flu-related hospitalizations for persons hospitalized between October 1 and April 30 of each year. For this season, more than 18,000 lab-confirmed hospitalizations were reported, resulting in a cumulative incidence for all age groups of 64.9 hospitalizations per 100,000. This graph shows the cumulative hospitalization rates by age group, and the highest rate there in green is for persons 65 years or older, and the cumulative rate to date is 290.5 hospitalizations per 100,000. Hospitalizations in this age group accounted for approximately 60% of all the reported hospitalizations this season. The cumulative rate for the other age groups ranged from a high of 65.1 among adults 50 to 64 years of age, to a low of 16.7 among children and adolescents 5 to 17 years of age. 
We monitor pneumonia and influenza-related mortality using data from the National Center for Health Statistics Mortality Surveillance System. The red line here shows the weekly percent of all deaths attributed to pneumonia and influenza with the 2016-17 season on the right-hand side of the graph and then the preceding four seasons included as well. During this season, the percent of deaths attributed to P&I peaked at 8.3% during the week ending January 21, and we were at or above the epidemic threshold for 12 consecutive weeks, beginning at the end of December and continuing until the middle of March. We also monitor influenza-associated deaths in children less than 18 years of age. This year, 99 influenza-associated pediatric deaths occurring this season have been reported. This is slightly more deaths than were reported last year, but fewer than were reported during 13-14 or the 14-15 season. 64 of the deaths this season were associated with influenza A virus infection, and of those with subtype information available, 94% were H3N2 viruses. 34 deaths were associated with influenza B virus infection, and one death was associated with an infection for which type was not determined. So in summary, um, influenza activity during the 2016-2017 season in the U.S. was moderate, with severity indicators that were within range of what has been observed in previous H3N2 predominant seasons. Activity peaked nationally in February, but there were, were regional differences with the western regions having a peak earlier in the season between late December through mid-January and the remainder of the country peaking about a month later in mid to late February. H3N2 viruses were predominant overall, but influenza B viruses reported more frequently towards the end of the season, in particular since late March. And lastly, the majority of the circulating viruses that were antigenically characterized at CDC were similar to the reference viruses that were included in the 16-17 influenza vaccine. Thank you. I think we'll go on to Dr. Ferdinand's before we have questions and answers. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to share with you our latest vaccine effectiveness estimates. Uh, so this morning, I have uh, two things that I'll talk about. The first one is I will review the end of season estimates, uh, the 2016-17 season, from the U.S. Flu VE Network. That is our platform that estimates vaccine effectiveness against medically attended outpatient influenza for all age groups. That will be an update of the interim estimates that were presented to the ACIP in February. And then secondly, it's um, my pleasure to introduce to you our new uh, vaccine effectiveness platform, which is the U.S. Hospitalized Adult Influenza Vaccine Effectiveness Network, or HAVEN, which looks at VE in, uh, against influenza hospitalization among adults. So I'll review that study and present the preliminary results from the 2016-17 season. So starting with the U.S. Flu VE network, that is a network that is uh, our annual study that estimates influenza vaccine effectiveness against outpatient influenza infection. Uh, the map here shows the U.S. Flu VE network uh, sites and the principal investigators, including Dr. Ed Belanja, who sits on the committee uh, from, from Marshfield, Wisconsin. The U.S. Flu VE network enrolls outpatients aged uh, six months or older who present with acute respiratory illness with cough of seven days duration or less. It uses a test negative case control design. Uh, with that, we estimate the odds of PCR confirmed influenza among the vaccinated enrollees compared to the unvaccinated enrollees. In this network, we define vaccination as a receipt of at least one dose of 2016-17 flu vaccine according to medical records, immunization registries, and or self-report from the patient where the patient can provide both the date and location of vaccination. To estimate VE, we uh, calculate it as one minus the adjusted odds ratio in a multivariate logistic regression model uh, times 100%, and we adjust for a number of known uh, confounding factors shown here, including site, age, sex, race, ethnicity, general health status, days from onset to enrollment, and calendar time of illness onset. 
So this slide uh, summarizes the U.S. flu VE enrollment for this season, 1617. We enrolled a little over 7,200 patients. The epidemiologic curve on the left uh, shows you the uh, flu A cases in red and the timing of the flu B cases in green. And the blue uh, is the timing of our uh, test negative or the uh, influenza negative controls that we enrolled. Overall, our pattern of uh, the season was similar to what was just presented uh, from nationally. It was a late and somewhat long season of peaking in mid-February. On the right, you can see the distribution of the cases that we enrolled. We had a little over 2,000 cases enrolled in the outpatient network. Uh, Two-thirds of those were influenza H3N2 infections. About 28% were influenza B Yamagata and about 3% influenza B Victoria infections. In terms of our vaccine effectiveness that we saw this year in the outpatient network, uh, if you direct your attention to the first line of this table, which reports the vaccine effectiveness against any influenza A or B virus for all of the ages included in the outpatient network, which is six months and above, you can see that about 43% of the influenza positive cases were vaccinated. About 54% of the influenza negative case, uh, excuse me, influenza negative controls were vaccinated. And that gave us an unadjusted vaccine effectiveness of 35%. And in that far right column with the blue box, uh, an adjusted vaccine effectiveness of 42%, which was statistically significant uh, with a confidence interval from 35 to 48%. The remainder of the slide shows similar vaccine eff effectiveness estimates for uh, different age groups that are included in this uh, network. We had some variation by age, but we did see a significant uh, protective effect of the vaccine in the children and also among the 50 to 64 year olds, uh, but the remainder of the age groups uh, did not have statistically significant effectiveness. Looking at uh, vaccine effectiveness by subtype on the top line, uh, a similar, you know, this is similar to the last slide. If you look at influenza A, H3, and 2 infections and all of the ages included in the US flu VE network, going over to the far right, you'll see we have an adjusted vaccine effectiveness that was significant and at 34%. And likewise, we have the H3N2 vaccine effectiveness estimates stratified by age group. And you can see we have a, a bit of variation there across the age groups, some of which um, have significant VE estimates and some of which do not. And at the bottom of the slide for influenza AH1N1 PDM09, which we didn't have a lot of this season, but we had enough to get uh, an overall estimate for all ages combined on the far right, you'll see that that estimate was 54%. Looking at vaccine effectiveness for the B lineage uh, viruses, for both uh, lineages together for all ages in that first row of the table in the far right in the blue box, we had a VE, a significant VE of 56%. Looking at VE against influenza B Yamagata infections in the second row, again, the blue box in the far right, 55% vaccine effectiveness for um, Yamagata and 60% vaccine effectiveness for uh, B Victoria. Now I'm going to uh, introduce you to the new uh, platform, which we call Haven. It, it was really motivated by the desire to know more about the effectiveness of flu vaccine against the more severe flu outcomes. Uh, it is a CDC-funded study to estimate effectiveness of flu vaccine specifically for the prevention of influenza hospitalizations among adults. I will mention that we do have another platform that looks at uh, hospitalizations in children, but I'm not going to be talking about that today. Uh, so 2015-16 was our pilot year for, for the uh, Haven study. We had seven hospitals. 2016-17, um, the results I'm about to present, was our second year, and we have now 10 hospitals with over 5,000 uh, acute care beds. The map shows the principal investigators and the four geographic locations of our enrolling sites. In terms of methods, uh, Haven uses very similar methods to the US flu VE network, although there are a few differences. The primary differences here I've underlined on this slide for your reference, so you can easily tell the difference between the two platforms methods. 
Uh, Haven enrolls adults aged 18 years or older that are hospitalized for less than 72 hours with an acute respiratory illness with cough of less than or equal to 10 days duration. Haven also uses the test negative case control design and estimates the odds of PCR confirmed influenza among the vaccinated compared to the unvaccinated enrollees. For the results I'm presenting here today for Haven, we define vaccination as receipt of at least one dose of 2016-17 flu vaccine 14 or more days prior to illness onset by patient or patient surrogate report. The analysis uh, is similar to that of the US flu VE network, where VE is one minus the adjusted odds ratio times 100% adjusted for a number of uh, covariates. And in addition to those used in the outpatient network, we also control for a number of indicators of uh, chronic health status, including hospitalizations in the past year, frailty, and home oxygen use. In 2016-17, we enrolled a little over 2,200 patients in the HAVEN study. The pattern uh, of flu A and flu B enrollment was similar to what you've seen earlier with the other, with the outpatient network. Flu A here shown in red and flu B in green and the test negative controls in blue. I will note that the analysis I'm reporting on today will only include data for enrollees through April 14th, although we did actually enroll up until May 13th. We have, haven't received the very tail end uh, of the data set yet. In terms of cases uh, on the far right, the pie graph, we had a, about 380 cases, so you know, clearly quite a number lower than what we typically enroll in a season in the US flu VE network. That makes stratifying by certain subgroups tricky for Haven. But in terms of the distribution of the type of influenza, we had about 70% H3N2 infections, 17% B. Yamagata infections, and about 4% B. Victoria infections in the HAVEN study. Looking at vaccine effectiveness from the HAVEN study uh, against any influenza A or B, in all ages included in this study, which again are those uh, just 18 and over, so that first line of this table, about 62% of the influenza positive cases were vaccinated and about 69% of the influenza negative controls were vaccinated. That gave us an unadjusted vaccine effectiveness of 27% and then in the far right column in the blue box, an adjusted vaccine effectiveness that was significant at 30%. The age groups, uh, we stratified by age group to look at VE, and uh, you can see that when we start sort of slicing and dicing the data a little bit, some of those vaccine effectiveness estimates uh, are a little less robust because of the sample size, but uh, we did see a significant protective effect uh, in the oldest age group, those over the age of 65, with a VE of 37%. Looking at the HAVEN VE effectiveness estimates by virus type, on the first line is a repeat of uh, data I just showed, which is all of the influenza A or B, the overall estimate. Again, focusing your attention in the blue box, that's the VE estimate of 30%. The second line, influenza A, H3, and 2, the vaccine effectiveness against H3 and 2 was estimated at 20%. And for influenza B, the third line of the uh, table, the vaccine effectiveness is uh, significant in, at uh, 53%. Uh, so as I mentioned, one of the motivating reasons why we developed this new network was we are interested in learning more about the vaccine effectiveness against the more severe flu outcomes. And we'd like to be able to look at these outcomes and this vaccine effectiveness against them you know, over time. Uh, sort of like we do with the outpatient network. So I do have data from another year of our study from the pilot year, which was 2015-16, and I thought I would just quickly show that to you. It has not been presented before, but to give you an idea, uh, if you focus on the, uh, the far left-hand side, you can uh, see a pair, the 1516 Haven estimate and the 1617 Haven estimate, the 30% is the one I just spoke about. But in 1516, we had uh, an estimated vaccine effectiveness of 50%, suggesting that the vaccine prevented about half of flu-associated hospitalizations in that season.
We are also interested in understanding a little bit more about how vaccine effectiveness against severe flu disease uh, relates or compares to the vaccine effectiveness among the uh, milder influenza outcomes that we typically look at in the US flu VE network. So here's our uh, first direct side-by-side -side comparison of vaccine estimates from the two networks. This is only for 2016-17. And overall, uh, each one of these pairs um, is for a specific age group. All of this is restricted to adults because the Haven study does not enroll children. You can see that both the inpatient and outpatient estimates are overall pretty similar. And specifically in that far left-hand uh, pair, if you look for all adults over age 18, uh, both the inpatient and the outpatient VE estimates were uh, 30%. So in summary, the vaccine reduced outpatient influenza visits by 42% for influenza A and B viruses, and by 34% for influenza A, H3, and 2 viruses. This vaccine effectiveness was similar to previous influenza A, H3, and 2 predominant seasons when vaccine was antigenically like circulating influenza viruses. The vaccine offered significant protection against influenza hospitalizations. The vaccine reduced influenza hospitalizations by 30% among all adults and by 37% among adults 65 years or older, and that's for both flu A and B viruses together. However, I will note that these results are preliminary and may change when our final data sets are available. And I'll end there, and I want, though, to acknowledge uh, the investigators, staff, and participants of both the US Flu VE Network and HAVEN, and also my team and colleagues at CDC who worked really hard to pull these numbers together. Thank you very much for both those excellent presentations. Questions? Yes, Dr. Atmer. Do you have uh, information about uh, efficacy, trivalent versus uh, quadrivalent for B in particular? Uh, we do not have that yet because we are still awaiting some final data that gives us detail about vaccine type that was received. However, we anticipate having that later in the summer and we'll definitely be looking at that. Dr. Ryan Gold. It's a similar question, and it, it has to do with, I mean, obviously the confidence intervals are very wide, but it looked like, if anything, the vaccine effectiveness increased than people over the age of 65 compared to younger adults, which would be surprising. Is that due to use of higher potency vaccines, or uh, do we know anything whether it matters which vaccine people over 65 got? Right, that's a, that's a good question. So uh, is it this slide you're referring to? Um, that, that far right hand uh, pair with the table. This one? Okay. Right. Right. Wide confidence intervals around those uh, vaccine effectiveness estimates that have been stratified by age. You know, some suggestion with that 37% uh, in the oldest age group that perhaps the point estimate may be a little bit higher for that age group. We will continue to look at this. Uh, certainly, we will look at the uh, uptake of high-dose vaccine in that age group that could potentially contribute, but we, um, we won't know until we get more data on vaccine type later in, uh, this summer. And it was the opposite in the outpatient setting. So who knows? I'm sorry, I didn't. It was the opposite in the outpatient setting. Those right. five-year-olds looked worse. Right. So um, yes, Dr. Riley. Um, I have to ask, any idea what it looks like in pregnancy? Do you have that ability to? I know that your outpatient sample is small, but um, unfortunately, you know, the outpatient sample is small for the, uh, you know, in the outpatients for pregnant women, and it, it's almost non-existent in the inpatient network because there are so very, very few pregnant women enrolled. So unfortunately, I, I can't address that with these data. Dr. Moore. Thank you very much. I, I'm wondering, knowing that adults don't shed virus as long as children do particularly, and that the Haven looks at people who have been sick up to, with a cough illness up to 10 days prior to admission, what impact do you think it, that has that you're misclassifying people because they're no longer shedding virus and can't be PCR confirmed? How is that impacting your results? Thanks. All right, well, that, that's, that's a good question. Um, right, so we in Haven chose a, a case definition that included people who'd been sick for up to and including 10 days, which is a little bit longer than the outpatient network uses. 
of seven days. And we, in our pilot year, looked at that and, and some supporting data, and it was, it was sort of a trade-off uh, because with Haven, we have a smaller number of cases overall in the hospitalized study, and we really wanted to be able to enroll as many as possible so we could get a precise as possible VE estimate. Um, but we also, of course, risk losing a little bit of uh, accuracy on uh, the outcome definition by doing that. But we, we looked at the literature and it suggested that there's not a lot of misclassification by extending out to that 10 days and, and some additional analyses that we looked at internally suggested that the bias from that in the VE estimates would be quite minimal, just perhaps a couple of points or two um, at most. Ms. Pellegrini. Following up on Dr. Riley's uh, question, it does sound like the system allows you to capture pregnancy? It does. Okay. And we, we can enroll pregnant women. Great. And is Haven fully subscribed at this point, or do you expect to expand the network for, further and enroll more hospitals? Uh, at this point, uh, we don't have plans to expand. Um, however, you know, after our five-year uh, current study is over, I think we'll take a look and be able to, at what we were able to actually evaluate with uh, this number of hospitals, and, and then we'll reevaluate that question. Hello. Can I anticipate a question that's going to come up in a future presentation, so asking you now? Um, certainly an issue that is going to come up um, is the um, differential efficacy in the older age group of the high-dose vaccines. And so are either of these um, studies robust enough in over 65-year-olds to allow you to give more specific estimates around different vaccines? Right. Um, I can let Brendan speak to the U.S. flu VE network. I believe you will intend to present uh, or calculate a VE estimate for high-dose vaccine. We will also, in Haven, we did look at that in our pilot year, which had a smaller sample size, but we, um, we had a signal in the pilot year that high-dose had a little bit higher uh, vaccine effectiveness, so we will uh, be looking at that carefully this year. Dr. Plotkin. Uh, so uh, if we're uh, honest about these data, the efficacy is, of the vaccine is only a moderate. Now, the question in my mind arises, uh, why is, is that? We have a putative correlative protection Generally speaking, 1 to 40 is considered to be an adequate response. However, the data suggests that that probably is only about 50% protective. And we know that titers wane after vaccination. So my question is, can the um, CDC start to do serological measurements as well as PCR? In other words, obtaining blood at the time of that influenza occurs to try to determine whether there is a correlate of protection, whether it's hemagglutination inhibition titer or micro-neutralization. Uh, I, I think this would be useful because perhaps the vaccines that we're using do not have a sufficient uh, antigen to elicit the type of or the size of the responses that we want over the uh, period of the influenza outbreak. And perhaps Dr. Bologna would like to comment on that. Uh, I would just ag agree with that. And I think that there's a, a need and an opportunity to do um, large community cohorts and follow them over multiple seasons with multiple episodes of vaccination. You know, studies like that were done back in the 70s and in Michigan and Seattle, and they have not been done in any recent years, to my knowledge. And But I think uh, the virology has changed a lot, the immunology has changed a lot, the vaccines have changed, and it's time to look at something like that again. But the flu VE network is not really set up to do that because we don't know who these people are until they come in with a respiratory illness. So it's not possible for us to sort of identify them in advance and get serum. Get a sample at the time they come in. Yeah, though that would that would be potentially possible. Yes, exactly. And many of them do come in within two or three days, so they're really in the very acute phase of the illness. Right. And I will add that one of the things that we have been evaluating during our pilot year, and also will evaluate from our second year in Haven, is the ability to collect residual clinical specimens from the patients that have been hospitalized. Thank you. Um, who's next? 
Dr. Whitley Williams. Sorry. Thank you. Um, Pat Whitley Williams, National Medical Association. A uh, question I had is about the Haven Network. Could you comment on the race and ethnicity data? I know you did collect that. Secondly, um, do you have any information about comorbid conditions uh, in these uh, hospitalized patients? And do you think these four, third question is, do you think these four hospitals are reflective of the U.S. population? Let me see. I should try to take the easiest one first, right? Uh, I don't know which one that is. Um, so... <laughs> I'll take the first one first. Um, in terms of collecting race and ethnicity data, we do it in very similar fashion as the US Blue VE network does. It uses these census-based uh, categories, um, and we collect it primarily, um, well, we can do it by self-report and from the medical record. And uh, sometimes we uh, then have to collapse that into smaller number of categories if needed for analytic purposes. Um, I don't have the number off the top of my head um, I want to say something like 14% of the Haven enrollees were uh, non-white, but don't hold me to that. I'd have to look it up. Your second question was, which one? Comorbid conditions, yes, um, right. So we, we do collect quite a bit of data on comorbid conditions in this uh, in Haven. We ask about comorbid uh, conditions and use of, for instance, home oxygen and frailty in order to get at that. We also collect quite a lot of information about the type of medical encounters these people had in the year prior to their enrollment. And from that, we uh, can determine if they have a history of any number of chronic diseases. So we, we do that. And in fact, in, in, in this network, about 94, 95% of the enrollees do have a chronic condition. And I, oh, there was actually a third question. Is it representative? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's four geographic sites, so it's, it's hard to say that it's, it's completely representative. We're glad we have, you know, representation in different geographical areas because we know, uh, like Alicia, Alicia was talking about, there's some geographic variation in flu uh, circulation, so we are glad we capture that, but, uh, you know, it still remains 10 hospitals at, at four geographic locations. Um, at the microphone, you've been waiting a long time. <laughs> Thank, you. <clears throat> Thank you, David Greenberg, Santa Fe Pasteur. My uh, common question is similar to those uh, previously. Uh, understanding from the very large uh, randomized control trials and the observational studies, including the CDC study of, uh, of, of uh, benefit of the high dose product over standard dose in reducing both outpatient and inpatient um, uh, influenza related illnesses. I'm wondering if you can tell us, I, I understand, of course, that you're still evaluating it, but do you know what proportion of the uh, VE, uh, flu VE network sites and the Haven sites use, or what proportion of the vaccinees or, or cases and, and controls have received high dose? It, it, overall, it's about 60% nationally. Right, so um, let me speak to the Haven study first, and then maybe, Brendan, you can add about the U.S. Flu VE network. So we don't have the data yet for the 2016-17 season on vaccine type, but what we know from the pilot year, the 15-16 year from Haven, was that among those adults over the age of 65, about 40% of the vaccinees had received high-dose vaccine. And that's similar for the U.S. Flu VE network. Dr. Salaji? Yeah. <clears throat> Um, as we sort of contemplate the suboptimal vaccine effectiveness, can you refresh my memory at least? What do we have data? To what extent do we have data about prior vac vac vaccination in prior years, and how many years can we go back so that we could start developing this, exploring more this question about vaccin vaccination previously and the potential impact on the VE? Right. Uh, another. Very good question about a tricky, a tricky methodologic uh, issue with this. So, especially in Haven, when, when two thirds of our patients here are vaccinated, and we they have quite a history of vaccination in this group in particular. Uh, so, we are collecting information on prior vaccination. Um, we would like to get at least five years, uh, seasons worth of vaccine information. Um, it gets the data quality becomes a little bit sketchier the more years you you go back so uh, we'll be looking at that actually this year our first full year of enrollment to see what those data uh, look like look at prior vaccination effects dr sun 
Just sort of related question. So on your hospitalized population from the four different centers, um, are, are there any, any uh, do, do you look at uh, inter-center variability in their criteria for hospitalization, and, or are they pretty similar? Right, so uh, I would, about a, of our 10 hospitals, five or six are big tertiary care referral centers, and some the others are community hospitals. Uh, so there are differences in the patient populations uh, between those two groups. Uh, we used a standard case definition across the entire uh, study, so each study site uh, used exactly the same sort of set of symptoms to uh, determine which patients might be eligible. So from that perspective, I think they'll be fairly uh, consistent. Perhaps uh, there could be some differences in the types of patients that are hospitalized at the different facilities. Thank you very much. Um, this was excellent. I think we'll move on now because I am a little worried about getting you all to lunch. So, uh, so the next presentation is... Uh, uh, vaccine safety update. Hi, I'm Tom Shimabokuro with the Immunization Safety Office, and I'll be giving the end of season update 2016 2017 influenza vaccine safety monitoring. So these are the US influenza vaccine abbreviations. Most of you are familiar with. I just want to highlight that high-dose trivalent and adjuvanted trivalent vaccines are approved for use in individuals 65 and older. For the other vaccines, there's some variability on the, the lower end of the age spectrum. I'll start off with vaccine adverse event reporting system surveillance for the 2016-2017 influenza season. Just to remind you, VAERS is our passive reporting system that's co-administered by CDC and FDA. The strengths are its national data, it accepts reports from anyone, it allows for rapid signal detection, and can detect rare adverse events. Limitations include reporting bias, inconsistent data quality and completeness, and lack of an unvaccinated comparison group. And because of the limitations, generally we cannot assess if a vaccine caused an adverse event from VAERS data alone. So our surveillance uh, includes U.S. influenza vaccine reports received in VAERS through May 26, 2017 for patients vaccinated July 1, 2016 through May 1, 2017. Signs, symptoms, and diagnoses are coded using medical dictionary for regulatory activities terms. And we perform clinical review of reports. This includes medical records when available for all serious reports after all types of vaccines. And serious is defined by the Code of Federal Regulations as death, life-threatening illness, hospitalization, or prolongation of hospitalization, or permanent disability. We also reviewed anaphylaxis reports in persons with a history of egg allergy and pregnancy reports for spontaneous abortion, stillbirth, stillbirth congenital anomalies, and serious pregnancy reports. We also conducted empirical Bayesian data mining. So this table shows U.S. reports to VAERS following trivalent, quadrivalent, and trivalent high dose for the current season. You see the vaccines in the columns there. It's important to focus on the percents, not necessarily the raw numbers. And for these reports, um, serious reports range from 4 to 6 percent, and correspondingly non-serious reports were 94 to 96 percent. I want to emphasize that this does not mean that 4 to 6 percent of people that got an influenza vac vaccination had a serious adverse event. What this means, VAERS is a, is a partial numerator only system. What this means is that of the VAERS reports for these products, 4 to 6% met the regulatory definition for serious. Uh, Guillain Barre syndrome and anaphylaxis uh, were, were rarely reported, but importantly, there were no data mining signals for GBS or anaphylaxis in association with trivalent, quadrivalent, or trivalent high dose. Three of the II4, IIV4 anaphylaxis reports, so three of those 27 reports were in persons with a history of egg allergy, and I'll describe these reports in, in some later slides. So this is a similar table, but for cell culture, recombinant, adjuvanted, and 
intradermal vaccine for the current season. Again, focus on the percents. See that serious reports ranged from three, uh, I'm sorry, four to seven percent. And um, uh, bo both for the previous slide and for this slide, that, that breakdown of serious and non-serious is similar to previous influenza seasons. GBS is rarely reported. Um, there were some anaphylaxis reports. Keep in mind that with these small numbers, um, those can make dif big differences in percents. But importantly, there were no data mining signals for GBS or anaphylaxis in association with cell culture recombinant adjuvanted or intradermal vaccines. One of the RIV3 anaphylaxis reports was in a person with a history of egg allergy. So I'm going to go over these four anaphylaxis reports in patients with a history of egg allergy and, and this is kind of fine print but I've tried to highlight some of the, the, the most relevant information. The first case was a six-year-old female that received Fluzone quadrivalent alone. The medical history was significant for food allergies to eggs, but signs and symptoms are not reported. The patient uh, had a, a flu shot of unknown type two years prior with no reported reactions. Symptom onset occurred within 30 to 35 minutes, and this was classified as a Brighton level three anaphylaxis case. Um, the Brighton classification goes from one to four with with level one being the highest level of diagnostic certainty. The next case was in a 37-year-old female who received flu block alone. And just to remind you, flu block is egg-free. This person's medical history was significant for hives to a flu shot of unknown type in the past, and diarrhea and hives after eating uh, eggs. Onset, symptom onset occurred within minutes, and this was a Brighton level one case. The next case was in a two-year-old female, received fluzone quadrivalent and hepatitis A vaccine. A medical history is significant for a, a, a quote-unquote positive but unspecified reaction to eggs, although it was reported the patient could eat eggs. Had previously received an inactivated influenza vaccine of unknown type and hep A vaccine without any problems. Symptom onset occurred within minutes, and this was classified as Brighton level one. And then the final, a report of anaphylaxis in a patient with a history of egg allergy occurred in an 18-year-old female. Uh, she received a fluria, inactivated polio vaccine, meningococcal conjugate vaccine, and Tdap, the same visit. Um, she had a, a known history of egg allergy, but signs and symptoms were not reported. And, and this was known prior to receiving a, a flu vaccine of unknown type in the past. And, that history is a little bit unclear, but that's what was in the report. I'm just um, restating what was in the report. But there was no contraindication in the, found in the report uh, to receiving IV. Uh, her symptoms, uh, symptom onset was within hours, and this was a Brighton level one anaphylaxis case. So this table is pregnancy reports in VARES following influenza vaccination for the current season. There was a total of 37 pregnancy reports. 36 of these were with standard IV3 or IV4, and one report was in cell culture IV4. Median maternal age was 29 years. Median gestational age, when reported, was 21 weeks. And the breakdown for trimester of vaccination you see there is roughly broken down in thirds between the first, the second, and the third trimester. Seven of the 37 reports, so 19% of the pregnancy reports included a pregnancy-specific outcome. And of these seven, five were spontaneous abortion and two were vaginal bleeding. 18 of the reports, roughly half, were non-pregnancy-specific adverse events, and, and this includes the one cell culture IV4 report. And vaccination errors were 32% were of the, the total pregnancy reports. So these vaccination error reports could be true, uh, true error reports. They could be reports where a patient received a, a flu vaccine and the person providing perceived this to be an error. So it might not be a true error, but it was perceived to be an error and therefore coded as an error. And then some of these reports include patients who received multiple vaccines. And one of those other vaccines may have been the vaccine given an error flu vaccine was 
basically along for the ride and that report was coded as, as an error. So that, that, that shows up as an error report. So summary for VAR surveillance and our plans for next season. There are no new safety concerns detected for IV, IVs, cell culture, recombinant, or adjuvanted vaccine during the 2016-2017 influenza season. Surveillance for the 2017-2018 influenza season will include enhanced safety monitoring for adjuvanted vaccine, intradermal, recombinant, quadrivalent vaccine, all pregnancy reports and anaphylaxis reports and persons with a history of egg allergy. I'm moving on to FDA surveillance for GBS. FDA conducts near real time, and I just want to note, I'm presenting this on behalf of our colleagues in the Office of Biostatistics and Epidemiology at FDA. FDA conducts near real time surveillance for GBS after influenza vaccination on Medicare fee-for-service beneficiaries. About half of these beneficiaries receive influenza vaccination every season. The population under surveillance is about 15 to 16 million beneficiaries per season. Almost 99% are age 65 years and older. FDA compares the current season's GBS rate with a historical rate. Previously, it has been three seasons, but in the 2016-2017 season, FDA used the past five seasons to help with stability of data. FDA uses updated sequential probability ratio testing to account for delay, both claims delay and clinical delay. If the observed rate exceeds a critical limit, that constitutes a statistical signal. CMS data are refreshed each week, although it takes up to 10 weeks for data to mature. So in week 17 of surveillance, and that was data as, as of December 9th, 2016, the current GBS rate for the primary outcome was greater than the historical rate. And I'll show this on the, on a slide, the next slide. But by week 20, the GBS rate in the current season declined and was very close to the historical rate. So this side may be a, a little bit difficult um, to see from, at least from the rear, but the dotted lines you see there are our, our vaccine doses administered, and then the solid lines are observed GBS rates by, by week of surveillance going from week one to week 40. The current season is the orange line, and if you see that light, that lightish green line, um, solid line, that was last season. That's when there was a signal for GBS in FDA's GBS monitoring in the CMS data. Just to remind you, there was also signal detected in VSD rapid cycle analysis for GBS as well. So that, that spike you see, I'm, I'm, I'm referring to the orange line, that spike you see there was, a, was an anomaly early in the season which when looked into uh, was resolved and that's why you see it drop back down to zero. So by week 17, 17 here, go up, and you, you don't see any prominent um, markings on the graph but by week 17 of surveillance, the current GBS rate for the primary outcome was greater than the historical rate, so the rate exceeded the critical value and they had a signal. By week 20, here's week 20, go up, see how kind of the rate kind of flattens out a little bit? By week 20, the GBS rate in the current season declined and is very close to the historical rate based on previous five seasons combined. And the GBS rate in the current season is very close to the average of the past five seasons. However, the GBS rate is lower than the GBS rate in the 2015-2016 season. This line here, where it was 7.25 GBS cases per million vaccines. FDA plans to conduct an end of season self-controlled risk analysis self-controlled risk interval analysis. However, there is not sufficient data for 80% 80, 80 power yet, indicating that the number of GBS cases was quite small this season. So in week 40 of surveillance, the GBS rate in a six week risk window was 5.96 per million vaccinees compared to an average of 5.7 per million vaccinees in the prior five seasons. End of season analysis using self-controlled designs is to be conducted when 99% of fee-for-service beneficiaries have been vaccinated. The limitations of the surveillance include comparison to historical data, 
claims-based analysis, and no control for confounders. So now I'll move into vaccine safety data link rapid cycle analysis for the current season. A VSD was established in 1990. It's a collaboration between CDC and nine integrated healthcare plans. Includes data on over nine million persons per year, and it links vaccination data to health outcome data. So vaccination records, health outcomes, including hospitalizations, emergency department visits, and outpatient visits, and patient characteristics are linked by unique ID numbers. So there are two methods, um, two methods that we use to conduct rapid cycle analysis in VSD. There's the self-controlled design and the current versus historical. And what you see there is a self-controlled risk interval design on the top there. And, and self-controlled risk interval design, each patient serves as his or her own control, and you're looking at events in the risk window and events in the comparison window. In this particular case, vaccination occurs on day zero. The risk window extends from day zero to one. The comparison window, the control window is day 14 to 15. The risk, the, the, the time period in the risk window is considered exposed time. The time period in the comparison window is considered unexposed time. And there's current versus historical, where you're looking at events in the risk window in patients in the current season versus patients during historical comparison period. These are the VSD RCA outcomes for the current season. They include acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, anaphylaxis, Bell's palsy, encephalitis, GBS, seizures, and transverse myelitis. You see the age groups there in the next column, the risk window, and then the control window um, for self-controlled risk interval, for the self-controlled risk interval design. These are the doses administered in VSD. You said IV3 and IV4 dominate. That's approaching 90% of all vac influenza vaccine doses administered in the VSD during the season. About 450,000 high dose doses, and then um, really small numbers for the, the remaining types of vaccines for a total of 4.5 million doses administered through April 29th, 2017. So this, this table is VSD RCA results for trivalent vaccine using the self-controlled risk interval design. And I've highlighted the columns, the important columns, but I'll walk through this table because the next three slides show essentially the same table. On the left-hand side there, you've got the pre-specified outcomes, which I had previously mentioned. In the next column, you have the, the risk interval. The next column, you have the age groups that we looked at. The doses administered, that should be IAV3, not IAV4. Then events in the risk window, events in the control window, relative risk, the log likelihood ratio, and the critical value. The log likelihood ratio is the test statistic. Uh, and the critical value is simply that, it's the critical value. We're looking to see if the critical value, ex or the log likelihood ratio exceeds the critical value. If, if the LLR exceeds the critical value, we have a signal. Uh, you may be looking at relative risk, and some of you may be even done the math in your head, so to, 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 uh, to address this question in advance, um, that's not always a simple ratio for self-controlled risk interval. You have different lengths of windows, and you have to make adjustments for uh, data lags. So focus on the log likelihood ratio and the critical value. You'll see that if you have a relative risk over one, you have a value for the log likelihood ratio. But in the case of the, the one down for, for Bell, in the case of this where your, your relative risk is, is 0 0.4, it's less than one, that is gonna be then set to zero. So you'll have a positive, you'll have a value for log likelihood ratio if your relative risk is, is greater than one. And an important thing to note, if you go down, you do the comparison, this value to this value, do this all the way down, none of these log likelihood ratios exceed the critical value, so we do not have any signals in the self-controlled risk interval design for trivalent vaccine for any of these pre-specified outcomes for this season. This is the same table, but for quadrivalent vaccine. 
Pre-specified outcomes on the left-hand side, log likelihood ratio and critical value. Whoops. Again, we're comparing this value to this value. See that none of those log likelihood ratios exceed the critical value for any of these pre-specified outcomes. So we do not have any signals for IV4 in the self-controlled risk interval design. Moving on to RCA results for trivalent for current versus historical. The, 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 the table setup is the same, except in this case, the relative risk is, is a simple ratio. Again, comparing the log likelihood ratio to the critical value for each of these pre-specified outcomes in the age groups. None of the log likelihood ratios exceed the critical value, so we do not have any signals for trivalent vaccine uh, in the current season using the current versus historical design. And lastly, this is RCA results for IV4, current versus historical, and there, none of the log likelihood ratios exceed the critical value. So again, for IV4, uh, we do not have any uh, RCA signals for the pre-specified outcomes for quadrivalent for this season. So to sum up the RCA results, there are no RCA signals in either the self-controlled risk interval or current versus historical design for any of the pre-specified outcomes for IV3 or IV4. It didn't show the results for high dose, but there, there was a limited number of doses administered in the VSD during the current season, about 450,000. There are no statistical signals or elevated relative risks for any pre-specified outcomes being monitored, which includes Guillain-Barre syndrome in either self-controlled risk interval or current versus historical designs. It's for high dose. Data for cell culture, intradermal, and recombinant are limited due to low use of these vaccines, but were generally reassuring. So VSD uh, safety monitoring and research for the next season, 2017-2018, will conduct self-controlled risk interval and current versus historical RCA for the pre-specified conditions, anaphylaxis, Bell's palsy, encephalitis, GBS, seizures, transverse myelitis, and acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. We'll continue work on a comprehensive analysis to evaluate the risk of GBS following pandemic H1N1 containing seasonal influenza vaccines for the years 2010 through 2016. This study is a follow-up to the RCA signal in self-control risk interval design for GBS following IIV3 detected during the 2015-2016 influenza season. Just to summarize, there are no new safety concerns detected in VAERS monitoring for the current season. There are reassuring results in FDA's near real-time monitoring for GBS following influenza vaccination in Medicare beneficiaries and CMS data, and no signals for any pre-specified outcomes being monitored in VSD rapid cycle analysis. I'd like to acknowledge the following individuals for their contributions, and I'll be happy to answer questions. Okay, let's take a few minutes for questions, uh, Dr. Romero. Thank you, nicely presented. Um, two questions, I hope, short. Um, in slide number 11, uh, under spontaneous abortion, um, do you have the trimesters in which those occurred? And then for slides 22 and 23, um, I noticed that there's no data on there listed for the ADEM, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, and why is that the case? So for the, these spontaneous, spontaneous abortions, um, these were clinically reviewed, so I believe we have that data. Um, it's not presented, and, but I can, I can get that information and I can get back to, uh, to Dr. Groskopf with that. But if, if, if that data was in the reports, if, if that data was available in the reports, we would have that information. And then what was the, which slide are you referring to? Uh, sorry, uh, 22 and 23, um, you list the, the different pre-specified right. outcomes except for ADEM. So let me go back to this slide right here. So you'll see for a a ADEM, we, we looked at, we did, um, we, we did historical only. So I'm not showing... I'm not showing results for self-controlled risk control. The reason is ADEM is so rare that there weren't really any meaningful data to, to present for self-controlled risk interval. 
Dr. Lee. Thanks for the really nice presentation. Um, two questions. One is uh, whether or not uh, the current versus historical comparisons actually accommodated for the transition between ICD-9 to ICD-10 that occurred during that historical period, and whether that contributed to the sort of elevated uh, GBS risk that you saw in 2015-16. Um, and then related to that, whether or not uh, uh, it would be useful to consider a case-centered approach to actually account for seasonality and secular trend. And it might be different, and you might get a slightly different answer than what you would find with the self-controlled uh, risk interval analysis. So that you're correct that these, um, that you, you're, you're talking about the, 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 the GBS signal we observed last year and then the study that we're doing right now. Okay, so you, you're correct. Those years do span the ICD-9 to ICD-10 transition. Um, my, my understanding from talking to the statisticians and ep epidemiologists and VSD is that is that um, the, the the problems with, at least with GBS is, is pretty minimal. Although we can't exclude that the the transition from nine to ten may have played some role in uh, in what we saw in the data for that season. And then your your question about uh, your question about case centered. Um, I, I believe that we are looking at multiple methods uh, for that study. Of which case centered is, is being considered as one of the one of the methods um, to, to to analyze the data. So so th thanks for that that comment that observation. Any other question? Ah, oh, back here. Yeah. For your data about pregnancy on page eleven, usually spontaneous abortion would be first trimester up to twelve weeks or less than twenty weeks, and so. Beyond that, you know, beyond those gestational ages, you might be talking about stillbirth or preterm delivery. And I think there's good data that influenza vaccination during pregnancy prevents stillbirth and prematurity. So I assume you're using standard deviations of spontaneous abortion. So well, that, I mean, what, what we use. We use this, the standard definition for spontaneous abortion. If there if there was a stillbirth, that would have been reported as a as a stillbirth. We're not combining fetal we're not combining fetal demise into one category. Those are spontaneous abortions, based on our review of the report. Okay, thank you very much for that excellent uh, report. Now we're going to move on to um, discussion of flu block, uh, Dr. Hakey. <laughs> I'd like to thank the uh, work group and the uh, committee for allowing us to present our data um, of flu block and uh, pregnancy. Uh, if I hit the right button. No. Oh. Yes, okay. Um, so our pregnancy data, uh, Protein Science Corporation maintains a pregnancy registry um, that includes uh, all pregnancies that are reported during clinical trials. Uh, as well as those that are voluntarily reported during uh, seasonal use. Uh, subject tracking during clinical trials is an active process, so um, this ensures capture. However, as for seasonal use, uh, our package insert includes a request for notification of all flu block vaccine exposures during pregnancy, but this, again, is voluntary and also assumes that uh, folks are reading the package insert. Um, the uh, last group uh, is some limited data from uh, a vaccine coverage program conducted in Mongolia by the Center for Vaccine Equity. So starting with our uh, clinical trial data, uh, our first study, PSC01, uh, occurred in the 05, uh, I'm sorry, 0405 season. Uh, out of 181 doses uh, given to women of childbearing age, there are three pregnancies. Uh, one subject received the vaccine at five weeks gestation and had an uneventful term pregnancy. One subject became pregnant three months after receiving flu block uh, and underwent an, an elective termination at 12 weeks. And a third subject uh, became pregnant 20 weeks following immunization uh, and again, an elective termination at 12 weeks. 
The second uh, study that involved a woman of childbearing age, uh, PSCO4, occurred in the 07 08 uh, season. Uh, this involved 1,371 doses to women of childbearing age, of which uh, there were 20 pregnancies. Um, of the 20, there were 12 um, uneventful live births, one spontaneous abortion uh, in a woman who received the vaccine two months prior to pregnancy and underwent a uh, spontaneous abortion at five weeks, two elective terminations, three that were lost to follow up. Uh, and two that withdrew from the study and would not provide pregnancy outcome data. So essentially five lost to follow-up. PSC-16 um, occurred during the 14-15 influenza season. Uh, seven pregnancies um, among 675 women of childbearing age. One subject reported a pregnancy three weeks following, following immunization. Uh, she experienced a spontaneous abortion six weeks later, and then there were six uncomplicated live births uh, to uh, total out the seven. As far as pregnancies after routine seasonal uh, influenza immunization, flu block was initially approved in 2013. Um, at the time of the last reported uh, pregnancy to us, um, uh, there were just a little over one million doses uh, administered. Um, in that um, one million doses, there were five pregnancies reported with five uneventful uh, full-term deliveries and again, uh, one uh, spontaneous abortion two days after immunization. The last data group is a vaccine, a vaccine coverage project in Mongolia. Uh, the program was conducted by the Center for Vaccine Equity at the Task Force for Global Health. Uh, the goal was to increase influenza vaccine coverage in that area. Uh, we donated 40,000 doses of influenza vaccine, which was given to uh, 330 pregnant women. Um, there we go. Um, there were uh, no serious adverse events reported. However, one has to reinforce that this was a passive surveillance network with uh, a number of limitations. Uh, there is no active follow-up of pregnancies, and the surveillance capability, uh, the surveillance network capability to capture pregnancy-related adverse events are uncertain. So, at best, this is somewhat reassuring data, but. Uh, uh, is, is hardly uh, the, the same uh, uh, follow-up that we would experience with someone reporting a pregnancy directly to Protein Science. Uh, with continued participation in the project, though, we do hope to uh, include active follow-up of individuals who receive uh, flu block during the pregnancy uh, to get a, a little better data. Uh, in summary, uh, excluding the Mongolia data, there are 35 pregnancies. Uh, 23 with a normal outcome, three spontaneous abortions, four elective terminations, uh, three that were lost to follow up, and two were also lost to follow up due to withdrawal from their study. Thank you. Are there any quick questions before we move on to recommendations? Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I think we're Dr. Roskoff. Thank you. Um, before beginning, I just want to give a very brief uh, thanks to um, everyone, CDC staff and others who contribute to work group discussion on a regular basis and also who um, helped immeasurably in getting the presentation and information together for you all today. So I'm going to provide an overview of the draft 2017-18 ACIP influenza statement. Um, I anticipate that this will be published uh, sometime in August. don't have an exact date. Um, it will be an MMWR recommendations and reports document. 
Um, I'm going to go through some of the points in the draft document um, with specific focus on new information and also a couple of um, areas where we're proposing language changes for consideration. But first, one aspect which um, is not being proposed for change, which relates to the core recommendation which um, basically is that the draft statement reiterates the core recommendation that annual influenza vaccination is recommended for all persons age six months and older who do not have contraindications. Um, next, uh, new information. Um, as we do each year, we go over the vaccine composition um, for 2017-18. Um, for the U.S. licensed influenza vaccines um, for trivalence, uh, the composition will include a hemagglutinin derived from an A. Michigan 45-2015 H1N1 PDM09 like virus, an A. Hong Kong 4801-2014 H3N2 type virus, and a B. Brisbane 60-2008 like virus, which is a Victoria lineage B virus. Quadrivalent vaccines will include the above three, plus hemagglutin derived from a B. Fouquet 3073 2013-like virus, which is from the Yamagata lineage. Um, this composition represents an update in the H1N1 pdm 9 like virus for 2017-18. Um, next, uh, we discuss um, new licensures and also changes in existing approvals for products which occurred since the publication of the last statement, which was August 26th of 2016. These include Afluria quadrivalent, uh, a quadrivalent inactivated influenza vaccine, or IIV4, as we abbreviate it, by Securus for persons aged 18 years and older. Flu block quadrivalent, a uh, quadrivalent recombinant influenza vaccine, or RIV4, from Protein Sciences for persons aged 18 years and older. And flu laval quadrivalent, um, which has had an expansion in its age indication. It was previously three years and older, but it's now six months and older. Of note, this is at the 0.5 cc dose. There isn't a new dose formulation. Um, just uh, to um, make a note for clarity, prior to this licensure change, the only influenza vaccine approved for six through 35 month olds um, has been the 0.25 cc dose of fluzone and then fluzone quadrivalent. Um, that approval still exists. We just now have two options for children in the six through 35 month old age group. With regard to LAIV4, Flumis quadrivalent, um, last year at this time, at the June 2016 meeting, ACIP made the recommendation that LAIV not be used for the 2016-17 season due to concerns about its effectiveness against H1N1 PDM09 um, like viruses during the 2013-14 and 2015-16 seasons. The draft recommendation extends this recommendation that LAIV not be used into the 2017-18 season. Um, we're awaiting further data on LAIV, LAIV4 and anticipate uh, that we will be hearing some in October 2017. Because um, at the time that the recommendation for LAIV to not be used for 1617 was made, um, one of the questions that was raised was whether or not this would adversely affect pediatric vaccine coverage rates um, for influenza. Um, I have two slides um, that summarize coverage as we know it um, for this season 2016-17 that just passed. Um, this data was put together by colleagues in the Inf uh, Immunization Services Division to whom I'm greatly indebted, indebted for getting this together so we could um, present it to you today. Um, this is preliminary influenza vaccination coverage for the 16-17 season compared with the 2015-16 season final estimates um, from NIS flu. And this data specifically is for those six months through 17 years of age. Um, month is uh, on the x-axis, and the coverage estimated as a percent is on the y-axis. Green represents 2016-17, red represents 15-16. As you can see, there's considerable overlap um, between those two lines, um, indicating to us that as the season progressed, coverage overall remains similar. This next slide um, summarizes data from the same source. However, this time we have some stratification by age group within the pediatric population. Um, looking at the first line, all children, again, six months through 17 years for the entire period um, as we know it now to date, um, overall coverage for the whole pediatric age group, age group is similar between the two seasons at 59% for 15-16 and 58.2 for 16-17. Um, stratifying by age for those um, six months through four years, and then for those 13 through 17 years, um, the coverage estimates between the two seasons are similar. 
For those 5 through 12 years of age, there's a difference in that uh, coverage is about 2.3% lower for 16-17 as compared with 15-16. Um, this is a small difference, but was statistically significant. Um, now, returning to the content of the 2017-18 statement, um, I'm going to go next into the two areas, the two topics where we have um, language changes proposed for consideration. The first of these relates to afluria, which is a trivalent inactivated influenza vaccine, or IIV3. Afluria is licensed by FDA for persons aged five years and older. However, since the 2010-11 influenza season, ACIP has recommended it only for persons aged nine years and older following reports of febrile seizures and reactions that occurred in association with its use um, in Australia with the 2010 Southern Hemisphere formulation. Um, the seizures were confined largely to those under five years. However, there were febrile reactions among children aged five through eight. In February 2017, at our last ACIP meeting, ACIP heard a presentation from Securus, um, which summarized the investigation into the root cause of these reactions and some manufacturing changes that were made as a result. Because these data were presented several months ago and um, are somewhat technical, I have included next four slides which summarize the main findings from Securus's presentation. These are the slides that were presented at ACIP in February, um, but just want to say that they are manufacturer slides. Um, with the initial investigation into the happenings in Australia, um, CSL Biotherapies, um, the company at the time that, that held Afluria, um, came to the conclusion that two factors probably in combination, um, were associated with these events. One was that for the 10-11 season, the composition of the vaccine changed such that all three viruses in the seasonal vaccine changed. We had the introduction of A. California 7, the H1N1 PDM 09-like virus into the seasonal vaccine that had been the same virus in the monovalent pandemic vaccine, and also the introduction of B. Brisbane um, for the B virus. Um, the second factor that um, they initially implicated was had to do with um, residual lipid and RNA um, complexes that were in the vaccine product after splitting. Um, this is an inactivated vaccine product. The viruses are split or disrupted. In this case, it's uh, with a compound called torodeoxycholate, or Tdoc. Um, as was presented to us by Securus in February, um, a study was done using a, an in vitro cell um, cytokine release model um, in which several different experimental settings altering the concentration of Tdoc used on the various viruses um, was done. And the original um, standard TIV formulation used 0.9% for the H1N1, 0.5% for the B, and a higher concentration of 1.5% for the H3. Um, the take-home message for all of this is that when the concentration of Tdoc used was raised to 1.5% for all viruses, that is what achieved uh, the greatest attenuation of the inflammatory signal. This data is also summarized in the paper by Rockman from Vaccine 2014, which is um, cited at the bottom of the slide. Also presented to us in February were two slides of um, studies in children five through eight years. Um, this first one is uh, a study in which a modified afluria trivalent um, in which the Tdoc concentration was raised to 1.5% for the B strain was compared with a licensed comparator quadrivalent vaccine. Afluria is the green data point. Um, the licensed comparator is the blue data point immediately below. In this study, among children five through eight, fever rates were similar. Um, in addition, the fever prevalence was were compared with historical um, fever data from previous formulations of trivalent um, CSL vaccine, um, and in the in new experimental uh, afluria TIV, the fever prevalence was lower. Another similar study uh, done in the same age group, five through eight years, in which um, you can see at the bottom of this slide a quadrivalent afluria in which concentration of Tdoc was raised to 1.5% for all four viruses was compared with a licensed comparator. Um, again, a quadrivalent, and again, similar fever rates and again, lower fever rates than were observed for the historical um, TIV fever data um, that you can see up at the top of the slide in red. So as was summarized for us, um, it was felt that uh, by Securus that with the change in the Tdoc, um, 
content for uh, for use in treating the viruses, fever rates for children five through eight years um, with the experimental TIV and QIV were similar to comparator QIV, and also that they were less than was observed um, historically with older TIV formulations of afluria, or I should say IIV3, the current um, abbreviation that we use. So um, in consideration of the discussion of these data that were presented at NACIP and that were also discussed within the work group, um, the first proposed change is that um, table one, which is the large table that's um, been in the guidance for a number of years that summarizes information on all of the vaccine influenza vaccine products anticipated to be available for the season, um, that table one be modified to indicate that afluria is indicated for persons aged five years and up rather than nine years and up, as it says currently, and that the footnote that occurs at the bottom of that table, which states that it's nine years and up, and also the reason why, be removed. The second uh, proposed modification relates to vaccination of pregnant women and choice of vaccine. Um, before going into that language, this is just a, a brief um, high altitude summary of the recommendations for influenza vaccine in pregnant women. Um, pregnant women were actually initially mentioned with the first civilian recommendation for influenza vaccination, which was made in 1960. Um, between that time and um, roughly the 1990s, um, vaccination was generally recommended, the language varied from year to year, um, but vaccination was generally recommended for those who had another risk factor, for example, chronic medical conditions such as heart disease or lung disease um, that conferred a higher risk for severe flu illness. Um, over time, it became increasingly recognized that um, pregnancy, particularly second and third trimesters um, in and of itself, was a risk factor for severe illness um, and also in some studies, um, negative pregnancy outcomes. Um, so we see in 1995 and 1997, first the third and then the second trimesters were added as risk um, factors among themselves um, without regard to uh, somebody having another risk factor. Vaccination was recommended by ACIP for women who will be pregnant during influenza season without regard to trimester since 2004. Um, Basis for this and some of the information that was considered included increased risk for severe illness in women, particularly during the second and third trimesters, um, adverse pregnancy outcomes noted in some studies, and in addition, there has been noted an association of some birth defects with maternal fever and maternal febrile illness. Current language regarding pregnancy in the ACIP statement says that pregnant women should receive inactivated influenza vaccine specifically. The work group discussed um, the information on pregnancy reports that was presented by Protein Sciences concerning flu block just now. The information on Mongolia was not available at the time, so that was not discussed. Um, in addition, um, we should mention that uh, there were a total since 2013 when flu block trivalent was first approved of three vaccine adverse event reporting system or VAERS reports of pregnant women who received flu block. Um, for two of these reports, no adverse event was reported. For one, um, a woman presented in clinic with vaginal bleeding and a suspected spontaneous abortion. Next two slides just outline some of the work group considerations that came up in discussion. The first is um, that there are relatively few data concerning the use of flu block in pregnancy. Um, there is more experience and more data relating to inactivated influenza vaccines. The evidence base, um, although it consists largely of observational studies and safety surveillance data, is overall um, on balance reassuring. Um, there is a much longer clinical experience with the use of inactivated influenza vaccines. Um, they've been licensed since um, the mid 20th century. Um, flu block tri uh, trivalent was licensed in 2003 and the quadrivalent was only just licensed in the fall and has not been used um, yet. It's anticipated to be out next season. Um, however, it was also acknowledged that uh, even for the inactivated vaccines, data overall are somewhat more limited for first trimester and also for some of the newer inactivated vaccines such as quadrivalence and cell-based vaccines. While there are few data relating specifically to the use of flu block in pregnancy, it was noted that the general overall safety profile of flu block in comparison to inactivated vaccines is reassuring. Um, for example, one concern that arises is um, reactogenicity and inflammation. Um, overall, reactogenicity in the studies where flu block and activated vaccines have been compared, um, rates of most of the local and systemic adverse reactions were similar. 
Um, relatively few additives, it was noted, are listed in the RIV package insert. Um, if one looks in the package inserts under description where it says other things that the vaccine may contain, um, including things that are used in manufacturing and are only present in residual amounts or other things that are more, uh, more actual ingredients, um, RIV has relatively few for example, preservatives, antibiotics, egg protein. However, it should also be noted that not all inactivated vaccines contain many of these agents either. Uh, not all contain antibiotics, not all contain um, preservatives. Um, flu block does contain some residual insect cell and baculovirus proteins in DNA as cited on the package insert, um, which is something that the in inactivated vaccines, of course, uh, do not uh, have. Um, the last uh, piece um, on initial licensure, RIV3, trivalent flu block, received a pregnancy category designation of B, um, which is similar to most of the other inactivated vaccines that are available. Um, flu block quadrivalent RIV4 was approved this past fall, and that package inserts incorporates the new FDA pregnancy and lactation labeling language, so it's not quite directly comparable to the previous language. So. In sum, after that discussion, um, there is a, a, proposed, um, a proposed change in the language for consideration. I have here posted both the current and the proposed new. Um, the change largely reflects the material in red. Um, the previous recommendation, most recently for 2016-17, um, states that, uh, starting from about the second line of that paragraph, the ACIP recommends that all women who are pregnant or who might be pregnant in the upcoming influenza season receive inactivated influenza vaccine. In the proposed revision, um, this is changed to uh, that all women who are pregnant who might be pregnant in the upcoming influenza season receive influenza vaccine. Any licensed, recommended, and age-appropriate trivalent or quadrivalent IIV or RIV may be used. Um, that is the end of my summary of um, the recommendations and proposed changes. I'd be happy to take any questions. Questions for Dr. Groskopf. Yes. To, just to be clear, the the uh, FDA licensing licensure for the trivalent and quadrivalent vaccines are the same for pregnant women. The um, as far as licensing for well recommendations for use in pregnancy is the. Rec is the wording exactly the same for those? The, um, the recommendations haven't made a distinction with regard to pregnancy and quadri uh, trivalent or quadrivalent. So either, I either would be usable. Other questions? Okay, well, seeing none, I th uh, <laughs> Ms. Pellegrini. I'm sorry, I just want to, there's some nuance here that I think I'd like to understand just a little better. In general, most any vaccine may be used for any purpose for which it's licensed, and these are licensed for use in everyone above certain age. Correct? So I think there's a subtle but important difference here between making what would appear to be an affirmative statement that RIV is safe in pregnant women versus just sort of staying silent on it and saying, we're not saying you shouldn't use it, but we don't have enough data to affirmatively say it is safe. I, I, I think we're going there in this, and I want to know if the rest of the group is comfortable with that. Ms. Dr. Kapp. Yeah, just to follow up, I guess <clears throat> my understanding is the FDA makes decisions about safety, and we're not, that's not necessarily our job. So I'm, I guess I'm a little confused about why we're calling this out. Do you want to respond? Dr. Sun? If I may make a, a, uh, a clarification. In order for a vaccine to be indicated for pregnant women, it has to be in the package insert and, and uh, specifically for that population. Um, we have many vaccines where it's licensed for adults, for example, which includes women or pregnant, uh, men who are pregnant. But we don't consider that to be inclusive of pregnant women. In other words, um, one would have to show safety in pregnant women in order for the label to say that it's safe in pregnant women. It's not, obviously that's, you know, that's not to say that they're not safe. It's just that there's no, that we don't have data to say that it is. And that's the distinction here. 
that it's not in the label. And my understanding of this change is <clears throat> simply to make flu block consistent with all of the other vaccines because essentially we don't have a lot of data, but um, it, there aren't any safety signals that distinguish flu block from the other vaccines that we recommend. Dr. Lee? I guess I have the same um, question uh, as Ms. Pellegrini in that um, this makes it an affirmative statement as opposed to the absence of a clear um, statement for it. Uh, it. It's almost like that sentence could be picked up and moved to a generic section, which is that we would be in favor of any of the vaccines, period, for any people for, you know, for whom, like an adult, for example. Um, but because it's in this section, it seems to implicate that we have assessed or weighed um, the certainty of the benefits and the risks and the balance of that. But in here, I see there's only a 1,000 doses that have been given, and it feels like we just don't have enough information, not that it shouldn't be used, but rather by calling it out specifically, it seems to actually indicate it, its use in this particular population. But it might just be my read of it. Dr. Walter? Uh, I think part of it is it's the way the rest of the recommendations read. They really do single out all the, or kind of mention all these vaccine products. So it's really meant to be inclusive and not sit, give an endorsement of safety. Dr. Belanja? Yeah, uh, uh, I would agree with that. I think it's just a matter of sort of being equivalent to IIV and especially in the first trimester, you know, there's a relative paucity of data for IIV as well. Uh, and from a theoretical kind of perspective, given the, rel the lack of data for, um, for flu block, um, because it is a recombinant vaccine, it, it theoretically, uh, it, it shouldn't be any worse than IIV in terms of its potential to cause harm uh, because it is theoretically pure hemagglutinin, recognizing that as with any manufacturing process, nothing is 100% pure. But compared to, say, we were talking about afluria, where it's a split vaccine, and you have, you have um, RNA, you have lipids, you have all sorts of other things that you don't have in flu block. And so just based on that, I would say I would not sort of give a penalty to it. It certainly would consider it to be at least equivalent in the absence of any evidence to IIV. Thank you. Other discussion about this? Uh, Dr. Hunter. Um, it's more of a comment about um, just whether or not the uh, work group acknowledged the implications of no preference between vaccines, that I'm not saying we should change that, but just that um, because the trivalent is less expensive than the quadrivalent and large systems often will purchase only one or the other, that clinicians often don't get to choose what's, in their opinion, necessarily appropriate for particular patients because of the health system they practice in. And that decision feeds into the manufacturing process of what is produced. And I'm not saying that there's a solution to it, but I'm just wondering if that was acknowledged by the, in the work, work group discussions. Dr. Walter. So you're asking, a pre was a preference acknowledged for any one product over another, or? No, the implication of a lack of preference uh, on the fact that there's two to one ratio of uh, trivalent to quadrivalent that's being used. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the intent of the work group was to allow use for whatever was available, so. Right, and my point is that in practice, there's limits to that because of the, the cost and the manufacturing. I, I think it's implicit in the recommendations this year that the work group did not uh, choose to make any preferential recommendations. That would be correct. Um, okay, what we would like to do is have a motion to approve the revised influenza recommendations for this season. Would someone prevent, present yeah. such a motion? May I just ask one clarification? So, because um, we're reading this out of context, so uh, it put in context, uh, Dr. Walter, would you say that uh, the intent is, is as was stated, which is that there is no preference, but um, 
you know, do you know what I mean? I'm saying? I'm saying like that pregnancy statement is sort of, to me, I'm just reading it out of context of the rest of the recommendations. But in the context of the recommendations, is it you're feeling that it, it sort of reflects the um, lack of certainty uh, or the differential uncertainty in the different vaccines, but we're not making any preference statement? Lisa, correct me. I think the pregnancy section talks about experience, isn't that? Um, the as as those of you who've seen the draft recs know the um, it's divided into two sections the recommendation summary and background the background does go into um, that in some detail um, in in terms of um, what literature base is available for each vaccine yeah that's helpful I think so, just, as long as the information is there that's really helpful it, the information is there this it really just puts it in context of the rest of the recommendations as they're outlined. Would anyone like to make a motion? I'm sorry, I have a different question first. Um, I'm still, s I'm uncomfortable with the preg new pregnancy language at this point. Could, is there an option to separate that out as a separate issue or a separate vote or consider it um, differently? I'm not sure what my options are. Um, well, there's no motion on the floor, so. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have any option you can want. I, can you can I make, make a motion yourself if you'd separate, like. Can, can I make a motion then, for, at least for separate consideration of the pre, a separate vote on the pregnancy language? Is there a second to that motion? Seeing none, I guess not. <laughs> So what that would mean is that we would separate the pregnancy language, all of the pregnancy language, I would think, um, from the document and consider that separately. Can well, I ask, can she, though, if there's a motion to approve the revised recommend? There's no motion no, on the floor. No, but if there is a motion on the floor, you are allowed to, in the context of that motion, make a recommended change to the language. Either way, there's no motion on the floor at the moment except hers, right. which wasn't seconded. Right. So, um, I'd like to I'll, second it. Okay. I'd like to second Dr. it just Hunter's for case of discussion. It. Okay. Um, so, uh, so let's have some discussion about separating out this language and voting on it separately from the full statement. Dr. Kemp. I, I don't know if this falls within that, but I'm wondering if the if if it's simply said any recommended you know, product influenza vaccine may be used and didn't single anything out, would that make it more comfortable? Because, you know, this is really not, the, this, the safety issues are really not our decision. And that's basically what the FDA, um, that's true for any vaccine during pregnancy. So would that help in terms of not, not making it look as if we've specifically looked at recombinant specifically. I just want, that, that might help. So are you suggesting taking out trivalent, quadrivalent, <laughs> IIV, or RIV? Any licensed, recommended, and age appropriate? Yeah, I think that would sort of take it out of the realm of we've carefully looked at all these different products. If I could raise one comment related to that, um, the one complication I just want to want you to be aware of, because I, I will need to insert language, I think, um, about LAIV. Um, the past, this past season, even though not recommended, it was available, so we did have to make sure that we included references to previous recommendations for its use or not use. Um, so to say any licensed recommended is probably okay, but we would probably need to make sure that we had a sentence saying LAIV should not be used in pregnancy because of the general recommendation to not use live virus vaccines. I don't, I don't think that's inconsistent with what's, what was suggested. I just wanted to mention we'd have to say that probably. Dr. Belanja. I, I think that would be an acceptable alternative wording to just say any license recommended and age appropriate vaccine may be used, LAIV should not be used in pregnancy. Yeah. Other comments, Dr. Riley. So is that, so if we say that, that is acceptable? Because honestly, as an obstetrician, I'm reading this saying, Great, we can use anything that is available in pregnancy other than an act, you know, other than a live virus. I'm seeing it as more choice, more women will get vaccinated. I'm not seeing this as, you know, anything, anything other than that. I'm just seeing it as, okay, you can use something other than just what we were using last year. So I guess I'm 
my interpretation of the of the read is different, and I think in the um, in the background material that you sent the other I don't know last week or whenever it came, um, I think it goes through that there are limits to the to the data that we have available, um, and that's in the you know kind of in the fine print if you will. But it doesn't. I guess I'm missing it, Dr. Atmar. I guess I'm a little slow in that. I don't see how the, the proposed language change really changes anything. Um, and in fact, I mean, this, these, this language is, is more specific about uh, which types of vaccines would be uh, age and pregnancy appropriate. Whereas the other language, we have to add another sentence to say specifically don't use LAIV. And, and it doesn't really address the, the relative paucity of data on flu blo uh, on the uh, RIV in, in pregnancy, e either choice. So um, I, I don't really see a reason to change the language as it was originally proposed. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, Dr. Freihofer. Sandra Freihofer, American College of Physicians. I'm a clinician. I see patients, so I don't have the knowledge base that you researchers have. So I try to think of these, um, these recommendations as what does a clinician think when they read this. And I think clinicians appreciate as much detail as you can give them. Another thing as I'm looking at this, I think of CCIIV. And it's not clear to me that that would be something included. I, kn I know you mean to include it in IIV, but looking at that, it's not as clear to me. Thank you. Ms. Hayes. Carol Hayes with the American College of Nurse Midwives. I think I hear Dr. Riley's point, and I agree um, that clinicians, and Dr. as Dr. Freihofer just said, a clinician, it's helpful if there's more data rather than less data on what drug is or is not, or vaccine is or is not appropriate to give. But I do think, as, um, as Lisa just said, that, you know, we've got to re remind people that we don't give live. And so I think we, the exclusion to me is almost more important than the inclusion, that we are saying what you cannot give or should not give in addition to what it is okay to give. I think actually to me those are, uh, the exclusion is more important than the inclusion. Just to clarify, the, the sentence with the exclusion um, falls, I believe, immediately after this material and will be there regardless. Dr. Thompson. Yeah, I just wondered, um, it seems like that, that sentence, the full sentence in red is just adding a lot of complexity, but um, the sentence above it basically says they should receive influenza vaccine, I, and my inference would be licensed and age-appropriate and recommended vaccines. So I guess I, I'm just not sure why there's an extra sentence. I mean, what, what, what's the add by, by doing that? that? It seems like it's causing more confusion. Dr. Belanger. Just, just in response to, the, I think for, for the work group's issue was, on the, if you look at the original wording in 1617, it said, upcoming season should receive IIV. And then it says IIV is what sort of specifies a particular type of vaccine. And the goal was to get away from that. But I think you're exactly right. If you say any licensed influenza vaccine and also specifically say not LAIV, you've pretty much said the same thing. Dr. Massoni. I don't know if this will help. Um, <laughs> but I think we're back to a problem that we've discussed sort of generically before, which is how most providers um, make their decisions. And although I completely understand the, um, the detail-orientedness of your committee, which is what it should be, in the end, providers, most providers, aren't reading these recommendations at the level that you're reading them. And so what matters in, equally, I think, is what's in the schedule, the hopefully eventually maternal schedule that we're specifically making and how things were articulated. So for example, right now in the schedule it says pregnant women who might be da, 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 should receive IIV. And so in some ways I think what you're asking us more is to make sure that your intentions are clearer in the materials that are being used and maybe not as much you know, we, I, get, I think we get the intent here, 
and, and maybe you guys are getting yourselves wrapped up in something that in the end it's more important how we communicate it, your intention, than what it actually says. I would agree. Um, as an effort to move this forward, Ms. Pellegrini, could I ask you to um, uh, revise or make a motion for the wording you would like to see and see if others agree, and then we can move forward to approve the whole thing? I, I think I'm, I'm reluctant to start words, wordsmithing here. <laughs> um, and so um, for, the, for the purposes of this year and this discussion, I will withdraw the motion. Is there a second to withdrawing the motion? Uh, second. Thank you. OK. So we're going to move forward now to discussing, if you could switch the slide to the wording of the motion. It's the last slide. <laughs> oh, well. And just it's to clarify, the, 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 the this year's draft um, recommendations and a summary are in, were sent out to the ACIP members to read um, about a week ago. So you guys do have the full document. So what I would ask is that someone would propose a motion that we approve the revised influenza recommendations. So move. Thank you, Dr. Atmar. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Dr. Riley. OK, that's what's on the floor now. Any further discussion? Oh. Yes, Dr. Kemp. I would like to recommend we make the more general statement, because I think less specificity here is better. But I realize I may be the, in the minority. So that would read any recommended licensed vac vaccine, not LAIV. Do we have a consensus about that? Can we? Yeah, we're good. <laughs> right? We, we can send okay. around revised I think we can send um, around some of the revised the wording well. and everyone can take a look. Unless anybody has any questions. And I think the message has been received. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, um, I would like to ask for some public comment. Oh, is there somebody else? I'm, I'm Pam Rockwell. Yeah. One moment, please. So, I'm sorry. sorry, I apologize. Is there a further question? ACIP rec summary revision that was sent around. What is described in here for pregnant women, I think, actually does not exactly match what we were shown, but actually the intent is a little bit clearer in this section. So I wonder if we can put up that, because I think it'll be. Does that make sense? I don't think we can put it up. OK. <laughs> if everyone would like to look at it. But I think, I think, I think the, um, the, the wordsmithing can we'll happen post hoc, and we'll send, yes. it, we'll send it to everybody to be okay. sure you're comfortable with it. OK, thank you. Um, public comment, would you like to introduce? Sure. Prior to our public comment, I just wanted to remind the committee that we do have um, one letter that was submitted um, for public comment from Alachua County um, that's included in your binders. And then um, we do have one public comment from Ms. Pam Rockwell. Um, the, her entire public comment is not included in your binders, but we'll have it for you for tomorrow. Um, I'm Pam Rockwell. I'm a mom. I have a child with autism. And I want to encourage you, the ACIP to change the recommendation for flu vaccine to add a contraindication for the first trimester of pregnancy. Um, most studies of flu vaccine safety in pregnancy only follow the child for the first year of life. But you can't tell if someone has a developmental disability until they're at least two years old. Um, last November, researchers at Kaiser Permanente published a a study that showed an increased risk of autism in children whose mothers were vaccinated during the first trimesters of pregnancy. It was four in a thousand increase. It's about 20% of the risk, the regular risk for autism. Um, this is the only published data that you have to make recommendations on. The FDA hasn't tested any vaccines for flu after one year. So it, whether that's um, flu block or any other vaccine, it, no one knows what happens after one year right now, except for this study. Um, I would really like you to make your recommendations on actual data and not on wishful thinking. I know you think that there's probably no chance that autism could be caused by a, a maternal vaccine, but autism experts will tell you that the genetics alone can't explain why autism develops, that there's an environmental component, and that early pregnancy is an extremely vulnerable time. A human fetus does not develop a blood-brain barrier until the second trimester, so it's more vulnerable to toxins and to infections. There are studies that link fever during pregnancy with autism. There are studies that link maternal infections with autism, including influenza infection. There are studies, 
Uh, individuals with autism tend to have biomarkers of inflammation and have more activated glial cells in their brains, indicating more activity immune activity. Women who have had children with regressive autism even have antibodies in their blood that bind human brain cells. And these antibodies have been used to make animal models of autism. Pregnant monkeys or mice that have been exposed to these antibodies in early pregnancy have mostly male offspring that show autistic-like behaviors. Even the genetics of autism point to immune dysfunction. Female relatives of autistic people are more likely to have autoimmune disorders like rheumatoid arthritis, MS, lupus, or thyroid disease. I'm not an anti-vaxxer. But if infections could cause an autoimmune version of, of autism, then those same, the vaccines to those infections could also potentially trigger that. But if you picked the right antigen, the, something that didn't cause an, autoantibodies or cause a fever at the wrong time, you might actually end up with a vaccine that not only prevents influenza, but it prevents the autism that's caused by influenza. But if you're not actually tracking which vaccines cause these, these secondary um, autoimmune disorders like autism or lupus, then you're not ever going to find out which ones could be used to prevent those secondary endpoints. Um, I'm a housewife, I'm not a doctor or a scientist. I have a 17-year-old autistic son. He was diagnosed at 20 months old. He's not a vaccine injury. They weren't vaccinating pregnant women 17 years ago. Um, but the drug that had made the biggest difference in his life when he was seven years old was amantadine, which is used to treat influenza. And it wasn't used because he had influenza, it was used because it also binds human NMDA receptors. And this circuit, the NMDA receptor circuit, is a really well-studied circuit that is a problem in autism. It's also a problem in Alzheimer's disease. Memantine is a very close cousin of amantadine. If you had an antibody that was shaped like amantadine that bound M2 proton pumps in the flu and bound human, um, human NMDA receptors. You could have a situation where if you um, fight the flu really well and you make great antibodies to the flu, you also have a risk of an autoimmune disorder. So this is one of those cases that's actually kind of bad news for you because that would mean that functionally you would have um, a good vaccine, that, that if you actually got rid of the autoimmune problems, you would reduce the effectiveness of your vaccine. And I'm going to point out that the I'm sorry, I have to interrupt. It's, it's over the time Can limit. Can I get two, By one a more full minute. minute? One more minute? Uh, how about 30 seconds? Okay. okay. So if you were to, so I'm going to point out that the H1N1 vaccine, when it came out in 2009, it was 75% effective. These days, it's only, um, around 50% effective, maybe less than that. But there's been a lot of vaccine changes in the, in the meantime. There have been hemagglutin in concentrations so that you don't have as many of those M2 proton pumps in the vaccine. And there's been um, um, innovations like flu block that don't even have the M2 proton pumps in the first place. It's possible that those vaccines actually already reduce the risk of autism, but you really need to look. In the meantime, the only thing you have on the table right now is that you have data that says that in the first trimester of pregnancy, if you use a flu vaccine, that you have a higher, a much higher risk of autism. And really, if you just made it second trimester and third trimester only, maybe you could actually improve some people's lives. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I did want to reiterate that your full comments will be available to the committee. Is there any further public comment before we take a vote? I, I'd just like to point out, I realize I'm not public, but <laughs> uh, that there is a public comment in our, in our materials. Hopefully everybody got it in advance we, and had a chance sure. to take a look at it. But I think it's important to note um, that this county has gone to you know, a lot of work to provide us with some disparities data that is worth us knowing about really significant um, reductions in their school-based immunization program because they couldn't use LAIV. Thank you, Ms. Pellegrini. Can we now take a vote on the motion that's on the floor? And I'd like to ask that we start with uh, Dr. Belanja. Go to your right. <laughs> Thank you. To my right. Um, Belanja, yes. Moore, yes. Salaji, yes. Walter, yes. Riley, yes. Stevens, yes. Bennett, yes. Romero, yes. Uh, Rheingold, yes. Kemp, yes. Hunter, yes. Zanolo, yes. Pellegrini, yes. Atmar, yes. 
the yes. Thank you very much. Approve the revised influenza recommendations for the 2017 and 18 season, uh, but we're not done yet, so you can't go to lunch. Uh, we still need to do a VFC vote. <clears throat> While uh, Dr. Santoli is getting ready for the VFC vote, I do want to let uh, the audience know that the cafeteria downstairs has changed their offerings, um, and there's only limited options, including Chick-fil-A. Uh, we do have Jerry's Catering still outside, as well as the restaurants across the street, but I didn't want people to go down there and not see the normal offerings. <laughs> Dr. Santoli. Hi there. Um, thank you, and I, I will try to be very brief. This is um, an, a version of the VFC resolution that's been drafted to reflect um, specifically the discussion around the age indication for Afloria that um, you had just previously voted on. So the purpose of the resolution is to update the recommended vaccination schedule section with the addition of a table of age indications for currently available influenza vaccines that are covered under the resolution and to update the information in the contraindications and precautions section. I'll explain that last part when we get there. So the eligible groups have not changed. So the language um, that's in white font is not changed. Where you see proposed changes, you'll see them in yellow font. Under the recommended vaccination schedule, the um, initial um, two bullets are unchanged from the, from the current resolution, but a table has been added to list the currently approved influenza vaccines in the VFC program, including the age indications for each vaccine. Um, the brand names are listed in alphabetical order, and you'll see that the first two rows, which are a Fluria vaccine, the syringe, and the multi-dose vial, now have an age indication of greater than or equal to five years to reflect the discussion that just occurred. Um, and again, a note has been added Whenever we put in a table with brand names, there's a note added to indicate that this doesn't preclude other comparable vaccines to these, but does um, add some information that was not currently in the resolution. The um, recommended intervals and recommended doses language is not changed. For the contraindications and precautions, we previously had pointed to the um, most recent influenza recommendation However, because that recommendation includes the information about afluria, which is um, not current at this point, now that a new recommendation has been passed, there's not a published reference that we can point to here. And so when that occurs, we actually just include the language. Um, and this is actually the language from the contraindications and precautions section that's taken from the existing ACIP recommendation for the season we're just finishing and which will not necessarily be changed based on the vote. Um, however, we do also include a statement that when something is published, another recommendation by this group within six months of the passing of this resolution, that that reference, that language is included by reference. And so this is a standard statement. But I, I, I can go back to this because I didn't give you much time to look at it. This is actually the summary of table two of the precautions and contraindications. So I'll stop there and see if there are any questions for me. Any questions? Could we have a motion to uh, approve the uh, VFC vote? So moved. Second. Thank you, Dr. Hunter and Dr. Moore. Any further discussion? Seeing none, uh, let's take a vote. Uh, Dr. Hunter, could you start and go to your left? Hunter, yes. Camp, yes. Rheingold, yes. Romero, yes. Bennett, yes. Stevens, yes. Riley, yes. Walter, yes. Salaji, yes. Moore, yes. Belanja, yes. Lee, yes. Atmar, yes. Pellegrini, yes. Ezanolo, yes. Thank you very much. The vote was unanimous. Um, and now you can go to lunch. <laughs>